didn't know about Futurize before this, but uh, now that I've come to hear about them, I think it's a fantastic uh, initiative by the Malaysian government. Um, and you know, I had the opportunity to speak to some of uh, the panelists before the session, and I must say I'm terribly intrigued by each of uh, the things that they do. So without um, further ado, please allow me to introduce uh, my fellow panelists. Um, first on the list is uh, I have to apologize. I'm looking at this now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. From the conduction industry, uh, can I please invite Akmal Hafizuddin Muhammad Adam, who is the co-founder of Carbina Consultancy Groups in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> Carbina is the country's first 3D printing hub for construction and prominent force within Southeast Asia and the APEC regions. Uh, they started highly investing in the latest 3D construction technology that benefits the construction industry and millions for the first time for first-time house owners. Welcome, Akmal. Could I now also invite Dr. Iza Aziz from the healthcare industry? Uh, talk, please. Dr. Iza is from 3D Gems, and I had a very interesting conversation with him on his ability to print anything and everything under the sun. Um, and, you know, I certainly look forward to um, speaking to him a bit more this afternoon. Um, in particular, 3D Generation uh, was established with the aim to industrialize 3D modeling and 3D printing. Uh, their vision is to become the pioneer in digital manufacturing. And um, from what I understand, Dr. Iza has just opened his uh, foreign company in Indonesia. So clearly, he's doing very well uh, and bringing uh, 3D printing in Malaysia places. <coughs> The next panelist, if I could invite, uh, is uh, from Academia, Li Hock Cheng. Hock, please come up. Uh, he's a mechanical and engineering uh, electronics engineer from Taylor's Makerspace. Um, and the, the final panelist that we have is from industry, Bruce Mui. Bruce is from three, B3D Group Sinverhat. Um, and he, I think, has uh, had the very practical experience of um, finding his way through 3D printing, having started in 2014, um, through learning for himself uh, what 3D printing is like and how it has uh, been able to develop and how he's now able to produce almost anything. He was telling me uh, earlier that uh, a client came to him and asked for an integrated set of flowers, combining Malaysian local flowers and foreign flowers, and he managed to do it in what, 18 hours? No, actually five hours. Five hours. <laughs> and he has a nice photo to show as well. So please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I could invite you to give a warm welcome to our panelists uh, this afternoon. Okay, with that, um, I probably did quite a... Uh, in uh, uh, camp, uh, and then... Uh, I, I I I first time encountered 3D printing in uh, 2003. Start from there. My career is all about 3D printing. If you ask about 3D printing, I'm gonna be very biased. <laughs> <laughs> Open up company 3D Gens in 2015. We trying to um, use 3D printing technology to create uh, human bones, spare parts, and uh, we only focus on the craniofacial. facial. And a lot of people ask me why craniofacial. I say that people will pay almost everything they have just to get their own bones back. So with the um, 3 d printing technology, we managed to do um, uh, customized medical devices. Uh, start from there in 2015, and um, through that, from medicals, we go for the uh, automotive, um, aerospace, and oil and gas. And uh, we have now located in um, Kejirutung, Shah Alam. Uh, last year, we opened up a um, company uh, in Indonesia, Jakarta, doing the same thing. And also in the UK, um, to um, actually promote uh, the use of 3D printing technology. Later on, maybe I can stream more about it. Right, thank you. We might have to print a microphone. Huh? Yeah. I don't think this can drag so far. Actually, uh, he, he mentioned yeah. that it's a raw battery uh, <coughs> replacement of the battery that he did. 
We, we need a teacher to tell us that. Uh, please, Hop. Hello, my name is Hop, and I'm from uh, Taylor's Makerspace. Um, since Taylor's is a university, I think they also recognize that this uh, problem-solving skill is very important in real life. So in order to complement the, the theory in the lecture hall, so they set up this uh, Taylor's Makerspace to uh, have the student come in to do their hands-on prototype and try to to make their project works. So I'm a person inside there to uh, kind of like coach the student how to design their project, how to plan their project, and eventually create, uh, produce the prototype. So because they need to make prototype, that's why 3D printing comes in very handy. Apart from that, we also have this uh, laser cutting and so on. But today, we focus on 3D printing. Yeah, my background is in uh, engineering. That's why I uh, use my expertise to kind of like show the student how they can design so that it is a uh, so-called 3D printable because a lot of printing you cannot just throw in a design and, and get it to print it, it will come out with a mess so you need to do certain so-called pre-work so that it will be uh, print smoothly then just now we also mentioned about the post-processing about the, the flower printing so after the printing, we also had to uh, teach them how to do some of these uh, post-processing to, to make their product really stand up. Thank you very much, Hop. Bruce? Okay, is that gone long enough? Yes. I can use without mic, it's fine. No, no, <laughs> yeah, you, you can pull it. Okay, good, more, uh, good afternoon. Eh? So, my name is Bruce, uh, from founder of V3D Groups, now rebranding into as a 3D forger. So we open a shop, a uh, retail shop in Sungai Wang. Feel free to go see around. You, get, you, you may, I swear, you never see so many printer run together and running a bunch of people sitting there to connecting stuff, right? But why we do that? Because we is early stage, for up 2014, and trying to make something for myself, which no one really helped me. That painful time, which you want something that no one really sell, no one really make, then you have to make it yourself. I try to help you fix this problem. So normally it's urgent, you cannot buy from the, Mr. DIY, definitely. Then only we do. So 3D printing is one of the interesting tools. It is just a tool, like a hammer. If you have a skill to use it, anyone can use it. Because 2023 now, the technology has become very easy. You learn a little bit of 3D modeling, you don't have to be professional, then you can work on it. And this is what, why we now going into retail. And most of the people go there, they will start open their mind and think, what can I do with this? When we have more than enough people think of this question, then Malaysia will change. So we're targeting to make Malaysia as a designing hub for internationally. This is what, what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, you know, as I mentioned, we have a very wide spectrum on our panels today, you know, from the corporate side into industry, construction industry, all the way to academia, and also uh, right down to retail, and it's a man on the street and how they might be involved. Right, so this is the case. We, when we go to 3D printing service, talk with a lot of people, this is the most challenging part to understand deeply. So every, this is also my main focus to train our team to understand what they actually need. Instead of you say F, what, te what kind of technology you want to print, we, we ask back to you what actually this works, what you want. Maybe you don't need that fancy technology to work on it. We can just do it. So, so the challenge is understanding and, and education and, and awareness, is that...? Yeah, it's understanding what actually the audience need, right? So we can deliver the right stuff. Instead of you, uh, you ask, you actually need a flower, you send me a bundle of leaf. <laughs> <laughs> this is the story we mentioned just now. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, and, and maybe Hong, you can share how you know, your role as an educator can perhaps help or maybe enlighten some of the challenges you face, which you were talking about earlier. Sure. Actually, I totally agree with what you said. Actually, I face the same or similar issue all the while. When the students were coming, they would envision that they would like to do certain projects. Then they will talk about how to do it, how it looks like, and what do they need, down to the nut and bolt this level. But at the end, when you look at it, there are much better ways to do it, rather than using this uh, so-called tedious way or fancy way to do it. So a lot of time I will start by talking to them to see what they really, really want and also what is the requirement because since it's academy, a lot of times their course have a requirement. 
So we start with that. Then from that, then we'll question them. Because we we try not to give them the solution directly. Because after all, we try to coach them to come up with the solution themselves. So we basically we throw, throw them a bunch of questions to say, if you need this thing, will this suit your need? So leading questions, at the end, they will come to a conclusion to say, ah, maybe I don't really need this. Or maybe what I need is a different thing. So, so in reality, yes, communication is definitely one of the key to, to get to what they really want. So technology, a lot of time, is already there. It's just whether it's suitable for what you want to do or not. Thank you. Don, you have a view on what are the challenges you've been facing so far? Oh, challenging a lot. Oh, man. It's a different perspective if you doing business. At least it's really challenging in terms of pricing, in terms, in terms of technology acceptance, you know, and um, definitely to make people understand that this is technology difference, you know, how the technology will uh, change the way how you do things. That's not yeah. But as a businessman, definitely it's, it's hard to, you know, when we try to get um, business, try to do project, and when we charge people, people will say, well, this is too expensive, you know. And more people don't want to do it, you know, because they they don't understand the technology and the yeah the we are uh, the technology acceptance is different. But in medical, definitely, you know, because this technology has not been taught in medical school. This new process that we try to promote is definitely not that people are unfamiliar. And so I say in the medical device in the hospitals, people are not familiar with this technology and how to make them familiar. And so our target is that from Familiar to familiar and from familiar to become a routine once we can change that people use energy a lot then uh, we can do business so definitely I think understanding about the technology is important uh, technology acceptance is, is really really challenging to uh, to make sure that in the industry understand and how to uh, to use it so that's why the reason vision is that we want to industrialize uh, a lot of companies that we go they not even use digital data for yet you know, one of the uh, factories that we uh, visited uh, before, shoes maker, they are still crafting the things, shoes. And um, and last time we received one from our national car maker, came to us and uh, tried to convert the old manufacturing process to 3D printing. But when we coated them, definitely they are shocked. You know, so there's a lot of uh, challenging uh, uh, challenges that we, we face in terms of convincing people uh, and educating people. You know, if you want to do it, you can't actually compare the old manufacturing process with 3D printing. You know, as 3D printing, you have to change the design. You know, use the advantage what 3D, gen uh, 3D printing can offer. Then you can see the advantage. So there's a lot of challenges. Then in terms of funding, definitely. You know, when we started uh, the company. This machine is expensive. Uh, about metal printer, yeah. Um, it is expensive. How are you gonna get that funding without the uh, government help uh, from the private? You know? So, for me, there's a lot of uh, uh, challenges that we face uh, in terms of technology acceptance, in terms of funding, and all that really, really uh, make us how we are today. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sorry, I'm not just just before. I, one more question for you, Doc. I mean, why is it difficult for your customers or the public to accept technology? I mean, this 3D printing technology. What's the hesitation? Okay. Well, normally, you know, people the culture itself, you know, how we produce things, you know, you already spend a lot of investment in in other manufacturing process. You know, 3D printing is how you build things. It's a manufacturing technology. No, you have a lot of uh, other manufacturing technologies, this machining, milling, uh, casting, you know. So if you have re invested on that particular product, which you are looking at probably 30 years to you know, to use it, and now there's a new technology coming in that say, now oh, we can do it within uh, a few days, you, know, you can offer this kind of thing, definitely people will try to see whether it's economical or not economical, you know, in terms of power, in terms of the materials and everything. So the cost definitely will be first uh, thing that they will consider, uh, how much is the um, uh, printing cost and so on. So 
that's probably I think um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, companies here, and I think another one is that awareness also. You know, it it three point things not only change the way how you produce things, that how you design the things. You know, you need to have very strong foundation knowledge to do it. It's not like a, you play print start very good. You know, there's a lot of things that you need to understand to print. There's a lot of uh, uh, unsuccessful uh, print. You know, during the process. You know. So the foundation is to be good. If you look at uh, dynasty, you know I didn't learn about this kind of technology before. You know, even I've been um, uh, advisor for most of the universities here. You know, private and also government hospitals. There are no dedicated three building costs yet. You know, the people still consider. If you look at you know last time people mentioned about rapid prototyping, you know when it comes to prototyping, people still understand this is just for prototype. So, but now it has it already changed from prototyping to manufacturing. It's no longer prototype. You can build part, you can print part, and use straight away. But a lot of people still, you know, thinking about prototyping. So I think this awareness and foundation probably need we need to do more in order to. This kind of technology. Sorry, I, I hung out there with me. I'm just being quite curious, and and, 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 and two, maybe two two questions, and both both related. I mean, you know, if, if let's say I'm a consumer, to me it doesn't matter whether it's 3D printing or, as you say, different. You know, the old conventional way of printing. You know, whatever is quickest or cheapest to me would be the product that I want. So are you saying that 3D printing is more costly than conventional printing? Yeah. It is certain. Yes. So yeah. why would one, why would you want to invest in three D printing if it's more costly than what you can get conventionally? No, it is costly in terms of you know there are few factors that if you want to invest on the uh, machine on the setup definitely it's going to be costly. If you charge people now, it is costly because you know if you use the same design to print out, or it can be manufactured with other because you can compare now. Last time I produced through casting, I get like one thousand ringgit. Now, three people charge me three thousand ringgit. You know, those you know, those kind of uh, comparison. You can't do that kind of comparison. But certain things, you know, that you can't produce any other way. If you now you look at the market now, there's no like a rectangle part. You know, there's an organic shape of product. A product will incorporate lattice structure, like the you know, because the uh, uh, in industry needs it, and there's no way to produce. Through other manufacturing process, then you have to look into 3D printing. And if you look at the market now, people want their own shoe, personalization. I want my own sunglasses. I want my own shoes, things like that. And that's why 3D printing not is suitable for certain certain application. You have to identify the application for medical devices, definitely, because personalized, customized devices is better than the standard. Devices. Okay, very clear. So, customize uh, specific types of products, 3D printing, mass market, not there yet because cost is still high. Two things. One, cost. Another thing is the uh, production. 3D printing can't do mass producing. Understand. Okay. Mass customization is okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Akma, sorry to keep you waiting. Challenges in your industry. Oh, okay. Now I remember the question again. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So the challenges that we face. Um, I think what Doctor mentioned just now. Um, of course, uh, if if you are going into concrete three D printing, you can multiply those problems by ten. The reason being is because in the market today, especially in Malaysia and Singapore, I dare say why it's more difficult is because we are the only player in the market, right? So, I mean, if you're talking about 3D construction printing, there's no other companies in Malaysia that's doing it, aside from SCIB, just to be very transparent with you. SCIB is Sarawak Consolidated Industrial Burhat, in case you are wondering. They are a Sarawak-based company, and they're server dynamic. So they are using Cobots printer, which is the printer that we are using as well, right? So, yes, definitely, um, Doctor and the other panels mentioned it um, succinctly. Uh, the issue is, of course, I mean, for me personally, based on our experiences trying to push for this technology in Malaysia, is on the regulatory front. That's number one. Right? On the regulatory front, we are trying to get support from, S, um, from CIDB, from JKR. So the processes has not been um, as easy as we would like it to be. Um, and we have to appreciate why that is so, right? 
looking at how the construction industry has um, stagnated for the past 20, 30 years. I mean, let's talk about IBS. We don't have to talk about 3D printing just yet. IBS alone. It has taken more than 20 years for them to implement, right? So that's why I say, if you're talking about 3D construction printing, particularly in Malaysia, the issue is regulatory acceptance. And once that has been solved, then commercially it will come in, right? So whenever we engage with uh, companies, you know, we have, we've been approached by more than 100 companies. The first company that approached us was UEM Sunrise, for example. I remember we set up the company just a few months. We put up our website and suddenly UEM Sunrise called. See, uh, that was a, a very exciting moment for us, right? We were very young, was three years ago, I mean, coming to three years ago. Well, in any case, the conversation stopped, right? Because they said, um, CIDB in Germany, how's, how's the regulation side? You know, can we get CCC on our structure and all that? So, you know, from our side, getting regulatory support is very crucial. Like, not only in trying to get the methodology to be accepted, but also on getting funding, right? I think doctor mentioned a, a perfect point. Funding is important, right? Um, we look at um, Dubai, for example, UAE, right? Uh, their government has mentioned um, very verbally that by 2030, more than 30% of their development must be 3D printed. You know, so you, you have that kind of political will that pushes company you know, to be able to adopt this technology much faster than we would like it, right? And we don't have to go far. I don't have to even go to UAE. Let's look at Singapore, right? Since KVNA, we are actually the exclusive distributor for cobots machinery in Malaysia and Singapore. We handle two markets, right? Just compare with Singapore alone. You don't have to go to so far, right? Singapore is beating us by years in terms of the adoption of 3D printing. Why do I say so? Just a few months ago, they've already elected a contractor to 3D print a component of their HDB units. So you are seeing actual 3D printing commercially used in their structures over in Singapore. In Malaysia, we are not even there yet in terms of getting it to be accepted. You know, we are still struggling to say 3D printing is you are printing it layer by layer, right? We are still stuck there, right? I, I, I do understand awareness is key, right? That, that is where we come in. We provide the awareness. That's something that we have to do as the first movers and innovators. I believe all of the co-panelists here have struggled through that as well. Right, but again, regulatory side is very crucial, and that's something that we I feel personally that if we can try to pivot or try to put more incentive from the government side for industry to accept, then I believe the acceptance can be much um, expedited. I would say. Thank you, Amal. Clearly, you're waiting for me to ask that question, okay. right? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Let, let, let me open this. I mean, is there anyone in the audience that either has questions for them so far? Yes. Yes, so many questions, please. My question. I, while I'm waiting for that, is, is CIDB in the, in the room? Is there anyone from CIDB here? No, not putting up your hands even if you're here? Okay, well, sorry, please carry on, sir. Nah, Could you just uh, state your name and yeah. the, who you address the question to? Before that, um, do we have any regulator here? <laughs> No, okay, so this is this. I'm the president from uh, Digital Health Research and Innovation Unit under uh, Institute for Clinical Research. So we we'll mainly talk about uh, clinical research, you know, clinical trials, and everything. Um, my unit is established to explore new technology. I think one of the issues with regulators is uh, you know, you're always afraid of unknown. That's uh, you, for you to start discussion with them is, is a challenge. Getting, uh, even from, uh, I'm from Ministry of Health, getting them to listen or hear or, or you know, uh, set appointment is, is even difficult. I'm sure it's going to be a challenge for all of you as well. So, uh, but from our experience doing uh, clinical research, I think one of the important part of uh, where it needs to be regulated in a way and that for our first challenge is to convince our uh, scientific committee to accept the protocol like for example I do have a lot of uh, I think two studies that we put up using 3D printing uh, one is, um, is orthosis uh, food and then another one is um, um, arm not even arm, hands 
Um, are there any questions by our educate committees? Uh, whether this NDA approved or not? Definitely. Obviously, it's not. But we have to talk to NDA in order for us to get there. We have to come up with our own pocket money to you know, get them to say this one no need regulation or pass. So those are the, the challenges from uh, even the research fraternity of government. I understand that we can work together uh, looking into this, uh, you know, in the bigger pictures. Uh, we can also do a lot of other things. Because uh, for 3D printing, there's no economic of scale at, at this point. And it's a really good point that uh, Dr. Rizal mentioning that uh, in medical, we need that uh, small tweaking where the manufacturing, mass manufacturing won't even cater. Even think about uh, catering that, that market. Um, Unfortunately, our, our healthcare is, uh, is, is always funded, you know, highly subsidized. That's when uh, we need a more political uh, will to actually talk about this and, and uh, the needs of our population. I wanted to ask questions to Dr. Zaha. You know, there are a lot of communities out there um, that uh, are not captured by the system. I was talking about uh, people with disabilities. You know, after we treated them in the hospital, they go to widow. That's one. And then two, uh, do you have any programs at the moment? You know, looking into this this population. <coughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. I did it. That I did it. Eh? Yeah. Uh, tough one. Eh? Challenge dealing with MDA. That is what MDA that we are I thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> definitely, we currently we um because we are not that big, uh, we are not that uh, in terms of the facilities and in terms of the people that we have. So for that particular reason, we we find partners, you know, and for these orthoses rehab devices, normally we deal with the uh, universities, you know, so they do the research, now we do the printing. And uh, even with the tissue engineering uh, UKM, we develop machine that can print your skin, and synthetic skin. So that's the way that we uh, do because our, you know, with our limited resources, we are able to do some of the uh, medical devices, and the implants. Um, and with the machine that we have, you know, we are able to cater all those uh, services. But to go more, because therapeutic can do more than that. Uh, as you mentioned, autosis rehab. This is big. This is really big. And for that reason, we work with the UTM. Uh, we we work with the um, USM to look into this area. So designed by them, we do the printing. Uh, we try to do the testing and try to get the um, um, the part certified. You know, part certified. So that's the thing that we do. So we open up to any other companies, universities, you know, institution. To work, we have a program. We call it uh, Collab to Innovate. You know? so under that program, we offer um, the um, uh, private companies, you know, companies, all companies, to work with us with very minimum charges. Uh, so like we don't charge for the design. We don't you know, really cut off all the costs to make sure that you can actually produce things. Uh, so that's the way we do to 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 help now. Thank you. And, and maybe I'll take off my moderator's hat and put on my hat. I was supposed to be a speaker, by the way, uh, and I had to fill in last minute as moderator. But, you know, and, and maybe this is a question to futurize, and maybe, you know, some of the ministries that should be involved would be uh, MOSTI. And under MOSTI, for example, I know they have a finance arm. There is in particular a, a fund called the Kumplan Model Pradana, which actually invests in uh, technology startups and all of that. So that could be something that you maybe connect um, some of these gentlemen to, um, because I know they do invest. And, and if you're looking for funding, especially if you're looking to commercialize something, uh, they would be interested. And not just you know government funding per se as a subsidy, um, because I suppose, as you pointed out, you need the political will. Huh? So Sabtu ini, yeah? can you get? Um, that's where you might get some political will. Um, OK. I think there was a second question by a young lady at the back. Yeah. No, yes. <laughs> I, I don't know your question, I'm sorry, so you'll have to. Uh, 
You state your name and your question. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Sharifa. Uh, to Dr. Izha. Okay, um, I grabbed three challenges that you mentioned just now. First is on the pricing. Second is on the technology acceptance. The third one is on medical resources. Okay. Uh, but from business perspective, uh, just now you mentioned that your company is exploring or already explore Indonesia. First question, why Indonesia? Is it because of uh, the market, you know, a bigger market due to the number of populations? Or is it the resources there? Or there is um, no limitation in terms of law and regulations there that allows you to easily penetrate the market there? Uh, that's first question to the design. I have a second question to Mr. Akmal. Uh, okay, just now you mentioned that there's a regulatory limitation that you always encountered. Um, what would be the exact uh, answer that you get from the a government body or the, the agency that you're working with um, that prohibits you or limits you from expanding your business? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Could I, could I just, for, the, for, for, for good order, uh, could you just tell us where you're from so that at least we understand where these uh, sure. questions are coming from? Sure. I'm so, from Oh, you're from <laughs> Okay, okay. So it's safe to answer transparently. Uh, safe to answer. Okay. Uh, first question, uh, why Indonesia? I think market-wise, um, they have Jakarta. Actually, we targeted only Jakarta. 10,000 government hospital, 3,000 private hospital. That's huge. That's really, really huge. And they have Jakarta alone, 80 million. You know, we have Malaysia, 30, 35 million. Currently, we are serving um, almost all hospitals and we get 600 to 800 cases a year. But if you look at Indonesia, one hospital have 2,500 cases. Only one hospital. So the market is really, really big. In terms of regulation, definitely they have, you know, we have to have ALKES, Alat Kesehatan, registered. So we have to go through all these things to... But same goes to Malaysia, you know, when it comes to customized devices, there are grey areas. Still. So, you can write on that first and later on when they establish the regulation, definitely you prepare. But you have to go through all these um, uh, fundamental um, for that uh, testing that you have to do, you know, and the licensing that you need to get before you really can sell things. Sure. Thank you for that very um, hot question. I would say, I'll try to be as diplomatic as I can uh, on, on trying to answer this question. Uh, there's there's two framework um, aspects lah, that you can look at this right when we talk about regulatory. There are two types of challenges, right? The first one is, like I said, procedural, getting the method to be accepted, right? One of the challenges that we face on this front, for example, um, to, put it, to put it clearly, for example, CIDB came up with a process called impact license, for example, right? Impact is for innovative solutions or innovative or new ways to do construction, right? So there's a process for it. <sighs> so we applied for it months ago, but there's yet to be any response in terms of how to move forward with it, right? So, I mean, it, it takes a bit of time. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure I'm not, I'm not trying to put down CIDB again. Please, if this is recorded, if you're sharing it with anyone, I'm not trying to put down CIDB or any of the relevant regulatory bodies. I'm sure there's a reason as to why it's taking some time. But then again, the speed of which we are trying to get this process done is taking a bit of time, right? Not only that, we propose, for example, we want to do trainings on 3D construction printing. We propose to certain regulatory bodies and trying to get it certified or endorsed by relevant regulatory bodies. And even our application for that has been stalled, right? There's no answer. We followed up months, right? No follow up. So that's why we've pivoted. We, we, we look at it. Okay, fine. It's okay. If the government is not trying to help us as much, I mean, perhaps there are other issues that they're trying to face. So they're trying, try, trying to solve the other issues. That's why it's taking a bit of time to go to 3D printing. Lah. So that's why we've decided on the training front, for example, we go directly to universities. Right? That's why we've approached Taylor's University. We've actually coincidentally had a meeting with uh, one of the uh, civil side about 
three weeks ago to discuss about developing a training program for universities in particular. So it's not just tailors, we've approached USM, UTM, UTHM, UMP. We went to Johor twice to go to UTHM, then UT, UTM to promote on the training programs, right? But at the end of the day, they said, okay, who's going to um, certify this? Is CIDB going to be on board? So we are faced with that challenge as well, right? So that's the first part of it, trying to get the procedural aspect to be accepted and supported. The other part is, of course, again, funding, right? We be very transparent again as a, as a standalone company. We consider ourselves as a startup. We've put up millions into our machines. And I believe it's the same for the rest of the co panelists here. And it's our own money, right? KBNA has been supported since day one by our own pocket money. So it, it, it is something that is very painful, especially when we try to apply for grants, right? Like just now you've mentioned Mosti. You know, NDIS, we've went through all of it, right? But still, no updates, nothing, right? Um, of course, there may be some issues with our application, so that's what we are trying to resolve ourselves. But again, there's no grants that are supporting us uh, in trying to promote this technology uh, as much as we would like it to be, right? So funding is the second aspect of it. So if you are trying to innovate, or if you are trying to have a new innovative solution to be adopted by Malaysia as a whole, again, Political will is a very crucial aspect to this, right? And it, it translates through having the regulatory body to be um, more flexible in purpose supporting us, as well as having the necessary funding. I'm not saying we are not asking, right, for 10 million to be upfront, you know, in our bank account so we can do whatever we want. No, but there needs to be a certain level of flexibility that allows us to apply, and it makes sense, right? 3D construction printing. No one has ever done it in Malaysia. We are the first to do it, right? So. Um, you know, funding is the second aspect to it. So that's the support that we are lacking and hope that answers your question. Thank you. I have a few, I don't know, questions or thoughts. I mean, have you considered or have you already maybe worked with uh, an architect, a civil engineer, and even those, you know, who have CIDB licenses and together collectively go and tell CIDB that, hey, this person with a grade seven or grade whatever it is, CIDB license, will stand behind me. The architect will sign off on the CCC the bomba certificate will be given, but I'm just going to print it. So as opposed to using the bangla to lay the bricks, this is a machine that's going to lay the bricks. Have you actually done that with CIDB? So here's the interesting fact. We've, we've actually been approached by um, industry before regulators have approached us, right? So as I've mentioned, UAM Sunrise, they've approached us first and all of that. But this is another mindset uh, that we see in local industries where they are comfortable with the way they are working at the moment, right? So even if they've uh, expressed interest, right, they say, oh, we're interested in looking at 3D printing, they'll definitely stop at a certain point to say, okay, we'll wait for you to have your own projects uh, with other people, then we are confident enough to invest and try to move forward with this technology. Um, so 50% of the conversations that we've had with industry is up to that point, right? They want to see... Sorry, the point where they're saying that there's no regulatory approval, is it? Or at what point? Or cost, uh, okay, no. Right? No, 50% of it, they say they are not confident to do, the, to do the projects themselves. They are waiting for us to develop with other developers, then only they are going to come in. So they are waiting for other players to do it. I see. Then only so they are waiting in. for a test case, basically. Exactly. exactly. So, I mean, so when you have done rolled out in Singapore, you will have your test case. Oh, pardon? You, you, you mentioned just now that mm -hmm. Singapore is going to construct certain HDB flats yeah. with 3D printing. With 3D printing yeah. So once that's done, you will have your test case, presumably. Of course. But again, they are, that is using a different system than we are. I mean, it's still 3D printing, but it's a whole different uh, manufacturer or supply of that printer. Lah. Of course, having any publicity on 3D printing will help to promote the technology, lah, regardless of it being from Cobot, ke, CyB, ke, whoever is producing the technology. All right. Uh, having commercial use case scenario locally would help to bolster the market uh, confidence. Lah. So I do agree, having a, those kind of cases would help a lot. But in Malaysian context as a, as a whole, uh, we see that the, the behavior of, uh, especially in the construction industry, they are waiting for other people to do it, right? So they, they macam, for example, we had a meeting with Petronas about last week, right? They're asking, do you have any existing projects? You know, we want to see, right? So, but in order for us to do that, we need support from um, for example, companies like you said approach the developers to do it, right? So these are things that we've not managed to materialize it. And if you expect KBNA to do the developments ourselves, again, it is cost for us. And we've invested so much upfront on the machine, get acquiring the machinery, trying to do all these standalone projects ourselves is not in our cap capability lah at the moment, right? So that's why we are seeking for funds. And one of it, as I've mentioned, is NTIS lah. 
So the entire S grant was meant for us to do one more prototype that will display the commercial aspect of it, and we can get regulatory approval through that process as well. So that is what we are trying to do, and that is what we are faced with, lah. Definitely. Okay. Um. So many points here. Uh, I don't know where to start. <laughs> um. Maybe I will start with one of several questions. Um. You know. Unlike, I mean, so so in Dr. Peza's uh, specific example just now, he was saying that uh, bespoke medical devices uh, is where 3D printing will come in uh, and, and play a very niche role because that cannot be done by mass manufacturing. So we, we understand that's where, you know, from a cost-benefit analysis, that's hands down, that's the way to go. What is the benefit, I guess, of 3D printing, of 3D construction? Is it because it's cheaper, quicker, you know, Environmentally more sustainable. Sure. Okay. Now, uh, Doctor Caesar's uh, explanation just now again, as I mentioned, why we say construction printing is ten times more difficult for us, at least with local um, context, is the fact that we are the first company to do it. And in terms of material, let's talk about material, right? Malaysia has only developed the first working material on concrete printing with our machine. There's no other material that works with 3D printer. If you're talking about concrete, lah, base, right? So trying to get, um, for example, um, eco-friendly material to justify sustainability. Right? If you're using 3D printing, there's a whole list of aspects that 3D printing helps to solve. Right? One of it is, um, if you're talking about the sustainability aspect of things. Lah, right? um, in KBNA, we, we call 3D printing as a mobile IBS plant. Why do we say so? Because you can imagine that the 3D printing is not being applied only for on-site application, but rather for off-site application as well. So it becomes a mobile IBS plan because in order for you to assemble and disassemble the machinery, it takes less than eight hours to do so, right? So imagine if you have a development over in Johor, right? You can have the printer to be disassembled, then ship it, move it via a 40-foot container, lorry, all the way to Johor, set up an indoor facility where you can 3D print components of a house, for example, part by part. Then it becomes a precast application, right? Then you can just simply transport the components to site and just install it as per precast application. So one of the ways that 3D printing helps to solve sustainability aside from cost factors like, is that the logistics of moving lorries, your components to site, usually takes up a, a lot of the CO2 emissions, like, right? Because lorries are moving a lot, a lot right? So that's the, the challenge that IPS plants are facing. Right? And also, not only that, IBS uh, plants are limited by the, 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 the parameter that it can cover. Lah. For example, if you have an IBS plant in Johor, you cannot do development in Penang because the logistics of the part doesn't make any more sense. But with 3D printing, it is a mobile IBS plant because you can move it anywhere you want. And the second best thing about 3D printing, if you compare it apple to apple with IBS, is that you don't need molds anymore. Right? Similar to how the other 3D printing works, there's no mold that is required. Whatever is being printed is straight away, that's the final structure you can, you are end up, ended up with, right? So cost-wise, upfront, comparatively with the existing IBS system, you are cheaper in that sense, right? And coming back to sustainability, you reduce CO2 emissions on that. And also just to highlight, we are engaging with YTL Cement, where they, we are looking into adopting RMC solution, ready-mixed concrete solutions with 3D printing application where they've already come up with um, a more CO2, no, a lesser CO, uh, CO uh, carbon emissions or material, basically. I'm sure YTL, you know if you're familiar with YTL, they came up with this green cement, uh, green concrete. So we are trying to adopt that kind of concrete without printing that would help to um, tackle the issue of sustainability. And last point is if you're using 3D printing, you are reducing manual labor or even foreign labor dependencies, lah, definitely. Thank you very much. And, and maybe this is a point for Futurize to consider. I mean, you know, the, 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 the idea of today's talk was really to see what regulatory sandbox would be required for 3D printing. But it sounds from the panel here that, you know, first of all, you know, more help is required rather than regulations. Um, so maybe that's, and also it seems to be across a number of ministries um, and not just uh, CIDB. Um, on that note, uh, I'm going to not forget our two panelists at the other end. Um, they were getting very comfortable and uh, <laughs> thinking they got cut off. You know, we have a bit more time, gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> so much to learn. So, and, and actually, on that note, you know, the question to the two of you: you, you, you in terms of uh, your perspective from academia, 
and, and Bruce, your perspective from uh, a consumer perspective, you've heard these two gentlemen here talk about all of the challenges. What are your thoughts on, on all of the things that they've raised? Okay, I'll go first. In terms of academy, a lot of time we explore issues. I mean, of course, you can say maybe lack, lack of a uh, particular team, okay? But these two gentlemen here already tell you that actually a lot of practical implications. So, if you ask me about the regulatory, my personally looking at it is that a lot of time we say to 3D print. A lot of people will say, can I print weapon? Can I print a gun? Right? <coughs> so, I believe in that regard, there are already existing law or regulation to govern that you cannot have this kind of uh, weapon. So whether it is uh, in uh, plastic or is it in metal. So I think, I think we can uh, extend that to cover it. Then the second thing I believe is uh, infringement of the IP. Because with 3D technology, you can always copy something. Nowadays, you can even snap a picture and then convert that picture into a 3D model and then print it. So I guess this needs to be regulated because we already have pattern to do this job. So maybe we need to uh, extend that as well to how to you know, regulate this portion in terms of uh, people's creations need to be protected. Otherwise, nobody wants to do anything because if I do it, someone else will just take it. Right? Then I put in all the investment and people just benefit from it. Then the third one I think is uh, more related to what we discussed here. It's about the safety, for example. Like 3D print building. Is it safe? How you guarantee that people who are the occupant inside that their, their safety is, is being guaranteed and all those things. So I guess this is new. Because in the old day for civil engineer you can calculate the materials and the, the, the so called the strength and all these things. Then it's very straightforward that if you put such a so called dimensions, you can hold how much weight. But for 3D printing, you, you don't know because the structure is all different. So maybe in academy, we need to study more about this together with the industry. Because we can come up with model, but we need the real thing. Then the industry can provide a sample and we can do testing. So maybe this will provide the regulatory certain guideline to what to approve and what to say okay. In terms of medical also, and also the food right now, we also can print food. So are those food safe to consume? Or is there any other effect long term? Because like food, you, you, you not just get stomach ache and then go to the toilet and get the body. Because it being absorbed into your body, then the effect may only being, uh, become transparent, uh, become for our parents few years later. So this needs some long term study in terms of academic science. So so this this is some of the things that come to my mind when we talk about regulatory. So it's not that straightforward I think. Yeah, thank you. So maybe let me um, earn my keep and, and weigh in from a legal perspective. Um, yes I, I agree with you that you know there must be laws to regulate. Otherwise, you know, how do you protect the consumers, the men on the street? I think that is correct. But like all things, there must be, you know, the law must come in at the correct time. So for example, if you introduce a law today, we've just heard a lot more say, it will die. I mean, you can't even get the first project off the ground. And the reason for that is because the regulators are not agreeing. I mean, as you pointed out as well, MOH or whoever it is, you know, NPRA, if it's a, a, a drug or MDA, if it's a medical device, will not give approval. So you can't even roll out the products and so this very nascent technology will not even get off the ground right so if you introduce those laws today without the necessary help uh, you will kill some of these initiatives the second thing exactly as you pointed out Hawk, is that what law do you introduce if you don't even know the effects right you also raise another point i mean currently actually credit to malaysia is malaysia has first class laws the problem with malaysia is the implementation is third class Right, um, and I, I say that as a practicing lawyer, a, a, and that's with all due respect because you see it's not easy to enforce a law, right? Uh, it's as simple as you know we, we're talking about here products, but if look at competition law for example, you cannot enforce competition law without economists, 
even if you have economists, they need to understand the market. And in this case, if you want to understand the construction industry, the medical industry, in particular what devices or drugs, it's a whole different ballgame. So if you don't have the facilities and the capability, how do you then enforce a law? Very, diff very difficult. So I think this panel is very interesting because we are at the stage, my observation, just listening, we are at the stage of a very nascent new industry where all the stakeholders need to come together. The industry, the academia, the consumer, and all contribute their views. And then you need to work and research and come out with those findings before the guidelines can be prepared. Right? But again, I think it's always a chicken and egg situation because where is the law behind that? Where is the protection for the consumer? And I see you raise your hands, but I would just finish off by saying that, again, we actually already have a lot of laws. So everything from guns. I mean, the penal code is so strict on it. You can't even own bullets, right? Um, you talk about uh, food. You have the Food Act. We have the Poisons Act, right? And so if you actually end up being poisoned, again, these are already offences. Yeah? Uh, you talk about construction. I mean, you can't even have a house and move in without the CCC. Right? So all of these things, to a certain extent, indirectly are already there. And then you talk about intellectual property, right? We also have that. You know, you have copyright, we have patents, we have designs, but not specific to 3D design, but we have those concepts already. Right? And Malaysia is a common law country, we also have the concept of uh, know-how, which is also protected. Um, now, I, I'm conscious, uh, Doc, you, ask, you wanted to ask another question, but I'm just going to invite Bruce to share his views first, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I almost forget I'm here, I'm here to talk. <laughs> no, because the answer that the problems are facing actually is we face it every single day. Of course, in the smaller levels, because we are not dealing with government, not dealing with big well, organizations, but we deal with all the bosses. Same thing, they will ask us, well, do you have sample of this? Right? Because sample is one of the things, because most of the, our person in Malaysia, like, we need to see something works before we dare to get into not people create not too many people crazy like us to go in step into it and try to figure it out and try to make it work. So this is how when I start as well. This is also every single day. So but luckily because I'm going to consumer, I already have more than thousand use case. Whatever almost anything you ask me, I can just take out some picture, show you how it works. We have parts in the private jet and the plane, we have parts in the car, we have parts in the factory of doing jigs and feet. We also have production, actually mass production side type thing that's worked it purposely 3D printing. Not really mass, it's talking about a few hundred pieces per month per year, not, not really mass production, but it's still selling overseas to Amazon and it works during MCO and boring making some glasses and stuff. Then it just works. So why I'm thinking, I don't think all these problems can be solved because my level is like, I have the, the sample. When you go into construction, go to healthcare, it's more hard. That's why I go, I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, I'm not a doctor or something, I'm just graduate in high school and come out learn everything myself. Even though I work in IT industry as an IT engineer before, but at, uh, end up to me is, I don't want to go through those hesitate. That's why I go to consumer. So I solve all the small, small problem combined. So they are pushed from down or top down and push from down top. So that then we can actually match in the center that, that the point maybe is now because it's become so simple for the consumer printer. It's look like almost two, three printers. It's just take it out and print. So, and just the problem is we, do you have the use case of it? To me, it's like, okay, if your use case is good enough or something spe need to solve your personal specific need, that is where you start 3D printing because no one sells to you. So same thing to bigger industry as well. When the company has something to fix, they want it urgently. They come to find you. It's where the spot, my value come in. And I tell them this one, if you don't have any other choice, 3D printing is for you. And they will, they will basically no choice. <laughs> that's where, that's why I always get the path easier. So Sam, if you tell uh, those approver of the organization for those these problems, because they don't have use case, I have option. So why do I need to use this and that is invest this kind of stuff? This is where, but you they, when they realize somebody else company with a younger further insight, almost take over their market with 3D printing technology that they, they start to get involved. So 
that's why I go to the to the right audience at the end. And luckily, the audience, I believe all of you go to shopping, right? You will see me one day in somewhere else as well in shopping mall because it is consumer place. And big boss, government people, maybe their child, they will go to shopping mall. That's where I go there. To tell them this thing is worth. I'm showing the showcase now to help you guys as well because they need to believe what it happened, it actually works. This is what our challenge is. Why at the first place, I say my challenge is the communication, but indeed it's the same thing. So let's make it simple. There's no other question to that. Yeah, I, I was just about to say that, you know, it sounded like a bright spot for them, but I got some bad news for you. Um, and yeah, I said Malaysia's got first class laws. We have a Consumer Protection Act, so you also have to be careful even though you are selling to consumers, right? So I mean, these two industries are regulated industries, the healthcare as well as construction, but we also have a Consumer Protection Act that actually, I think is one of the best drafted laws in the world, uh, 1999 Act. So be careful uh, because the laws are, uh, are that yeah, protect yeah. consumers quite well. But in the Malaysian market, unfortunately, we, you know, we, we are not litigious unlike the US and the, the, the West. Um, sorry, your question, Doc, just now you had a question. Did you have a question? I th yeah. Yeah, I did. Uh, not really a question. More of a talk. So, yeah. yeah, so if you need it, if anyone has one to take the mic, yeah, you are more better to come. Anyway, so uh, I'm a medical doctor. So there's a lot of medical legal things happening behind us. So I'm all for regulation. But, uh, we are not the first in the world. So the, the trouble with globalization, what more? I think the opportunity of globalization is we are like, uh, I'll say, from, uh, from that kata dalam glass. We see everything happening all around the world. Uh, my uh, thought is this. Uh, if we're talking to people like me, I will like always, if there's regulation, then we follow the regulation. If not, you know, uh, we have to be very careful. There are grey areas and all. But when you talk to the younger generation, we just come up with the innovation and nah, this is the innovation for patient. They already use for patient. So that these are other um, spectrum that we might also want to look into. You know, they may cause harm to the patient with the good intention. So this is when you know when the regulation is there or some form of guideline, guidelines that you can help to ensure the consumer is safe and uh, you know, the practitioner is also safe. And again, we are not the first in the world. Definitely we see all around us, everybody is using it. So I think that the, the discussion between the regulators, um, people like you guys, and um, hopefully people like me can, can start. So those are the things uh, to future us, I think. Yeah. How many <laughs> this is the first time I've heard kata uh, dalam glass. Normally it's kata di bawah tempurung, but I think that's absolutely correct, right? I mean, in, in today's world where the internet is so readily available, uh, news spreads so quickly, um, you know, and, 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 and perhaps that's also the frustration that you face, right? You see things moving so quickly, and yet here we are uh, stuck still in uh, at ground zero. Um, I'm sorry, any questions around the, the, the room? Anyone else questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Surya. I'm a lecturer from Massa University, and this is my group, Dr. Notin. And uh, we basically, uh, we have our 3D printers. Okay, we develop, we use our 3D printers to uh, develop prototype for our students and we train our students for uh, competitions, international competitions. We have uh, won a uh, few medals, but there's a question along the journey with our small experience. Now, what's next? What we are going to do? How we are going to develop? Uh, end of the day, uh, what uh, management, uh, uh, management would like to request from us is uh, what is the revenue using this 3D printer. I'm so sorry, huh? <laughs> telling the truth. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, it, it's a 
Uh, for us, it's R and D. Uh, in Malaysia, the adoption of 3D printing is still in R and D phase. Uh, we agree with that. But to bring it to the next stage, uh, we definitely need money. Am I right, doctor? Uh, uh, how we are going to develop it further? Um, from experts from the industry, I am open to all the panels. Uh, do you have suggestion for us? Because uh, we do R and D. We also pro, uh, printed uh, engine dampers. Uh, we have. Uh, we won't uh, tell that uh, we are experts, but we have printed using FDM process. Uh, but we we don't know where we are going. What is the future? But. Um, I agree. We do give talks on 4D printing, 5D printing, IR 4.0. We talk everything to our students. We give them hope, motivation, everything. And then uh, before going to sleep, I would probably think and ask my question myself: <laughs> Am I telling the truth, or <laughs> am I just teaching them what should I teach? Thank you. Thank you, Surya. That is 6D, right? You're also <laughs> telling us about ethics and integrity. Well done. Um, panelists, please feel free to uh, share your thoughts. I'll give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> what, what will we go next? Actually, 3D printing as a technology, I think is, uh, to some way, it is quite mature. But of course, there are more room for improvement. One of the examples is we want to be able to use more materials rather than just common money. Then the other one is the time. One of the drawbacks about 3D printing is the time it takes to print. So just now, while we were outside uh, waiting for this uh, session to begin, I engaged in a conversation with Bruce. A lot of time we should look at 3D as one of the technology. There's no different than other things actually. But it's just that right now it is new and it's maturing and we are excited about it. Prior to 3D printing, we, we use a molding. We, we have many other ways to produce, right? So right now we have a 3D printing, then we kind of like start what can we, we, what can we use 3D printing for? So I guess there is always this choice. <coughs> Depends on the context. If you really need mass production in terms of millions, shots, and all those things, then maybe you should still go for molding because that is most efficient and eventually the cost will get averaged out by per piece. Right? Then your molding cost will, will, will just become nothing. But if you want something that is really unique, for example, your, your case could be prototyping or teaching or whatever, right? Then maybe 3D printing is the way to go because you don't have to uh, involve in all this molding process. I remember my time last time when I want to create something new, I need to go for soft molding and all those things just to get the price down. And then it comes with MOQ. So to do my study, I just need five pieces. To do my research, maybe I need 10 pieces. But the guy said MOQ is 500. <laughs> so after I use them, I, I had like 400 pieces. It's just toy. Right? If people can play with it, good. If not, it's a waste. So I guess with this 3D printing, you don't need MOQ. You say like print per demand. How many pieces you want, I print. And then there is no storage. I print 500 pieces, the guy had to ship me 500 pieces, even though I said I just need 100. So it incurred the transportation fee, incur the storage. So for 3D printing, that's not discussion, is that you just need a mini server. Everything is in the digital. Everything is up put inside there. You just need to have a good system to retrieve it in the future when your old, old, old customer suddenly call out, hey, 10 years ago, I print this thing at your place. I want it again. I got that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess, where will this thing go, really? I guess as the technology matures, you will find its place. That's one thing. The other one is we should try to find a place for it also, rather than try to feed it into the current, um, what do you call that, the current manufacturing process, if it doesn't fit. Right? We will just try to 
get it in there. I, I think that, that is very difficult. So for the building construction industry, maybe there are certain mechanisms inside there. That is very difficult to make. A 3D printing will make it so easy. So they don't have to print the whole building. Maybe just that portion alone. Maybe they want a room that that can rotate. Maybe certain times in the future we will like a theater to, to function that way. <coughs> then maybe that part can be pretty quick. Because not many people want to build theater in the house. Right? That's all. Any other questions? All right, interesting. <laughs> If you look at the uh, articles, the future manufacturing technology that will replace other manufacturing technology is 3D printing. It's going to be used like, you know, we said last time when you watch this uh, face off, yeah, you don't believe it. How can people put in things like that? But no. If you look at the market, business point of view, the uh, industry now moving towards personalization. People are looking for it. Not for medical purpose, I don't, but custom, customers now moving towards personalization. They want their own shoes, they want their own uh, features on the things. Um, that's on a business point of view. And uh, for medicals, you know, the future that they vision is that the 3D printing will be in the operation theater. You need a new skin, Print it out, put it to the patient. You need a new skulls, print, put it to right away. Two things that need to, one is in terms, in terms of materials. You know, now we have limited materials. But 2014, 2000, um, I think in, in 2014, there's a few plastic materials that are capable to do, but now there's a lot of materials that are coming out. And in terms of the machine, so advance of the machine and advance of material will lead this thing. Last time, metal printer only one laser. Now they come up with dual laser. Now quad laser. Even the bigger metal printer have twelve laser. Why? Because of the speed. You know, average printing per millimeter is one hour. If you have ten millimeters. 10 hours at least but now with the quad laser, quad laser you can get 10 hours maybe to 2 hours the new technology this is not about the mission the new technology clip technology is considered 10 times faster than yours you know you put into the uh, resin which they have a three axis they fuse the material in the resin load Pull it out, done. What uh, uh, Adidas use clip for these um, shoes, yeah, for mass produce. But they have a lot of clip machine. It's a three D printing form, you know, it's possible. But I believe that you know, definitely in future, you know, even in, in organs, yeah, in Israel they print organs, not yet being used. But so that this is 2023, 20, maybe another five years, we can get it done. So it keep changing. But, and people getting smarter and they demanding, you know, I want to have lighter things. I want to have an organic shape, you know, which you can't do it other process. Yeah, lattice structures, how are you going to do it? Mm -hmm. Internal structures, you can't do it, you know. So I believe that 3D printing will definitely will, will change the way how we do things, will change the way how we do business. And definitely you can find, you know, to do business with it, you have to find the right application. Right? You know, the reason why people are why are you doing 3D printing for medical? And medicals and also for current patients, why don't you do with autosis <laughs> you have things, you know? Because there's no other thing that you can do that. So for to print titanium, it's not possible ten years ago. This is titanium, it's a reactive material, a flammable uh, powder. But now you are able to do it. Now, even you have titanium nickel, you now you have 40 printing. You know, nickel titanium together is a shape memory. Change. This is now is possible. So, uh, 
you know, the advance of the technology definitely, you know, push and uh, your application wise become widespread. You know, instead of you using other method, probably you can use three printing. But I see, but we are now. If we are not yet into three D printing, definitely it's going to be hard. I mean, comes five years later. So, but I'm I know we have people that get into three printers now. Then about three printing, and we have agency that get involved in do this kind of awareness. And I have to, uh, you know, motivate you guys as well. You know, <laughs> KPI definitely. You know, you be asked. I think a lot of university lecturers need to deal with a lot of things. You know, students one thing, and you have to find commercial value. Every time that they ask us to, Doc, uh, we want to buy a metal printer. How are we going to do the ROI? You know, things like that. But I believe that strategic collaboration is important. You know, you can't have everything by your own. You know, have a partnership. You know, so with the companies like uh, B3 Group, you know, they are experts in the plastic part. You know, all this FDM technology. You know, deal with them. Let them be experts in that so you can cut costs and everything instead of you trying to build up this thing. So, partnership with the application, with the industry, will help you in terms of getting back the ROI. Uh -huh. I think I'll just add a little bit of a point there. Uh, I, uh, no, sorry. I would like to echo one of the points that you've mentioned. I think from uh, an education standpoint, right? Uh, rightfully so, you've mentioned, Doctor. Um, I strongly support the idea that we need to prepare the human capital for what is to come, right? Rather than waiting for the technology to mature later, having it more advanced, as you mentioned, you're talking about 4D printing and you know how Adidas is using the 3D printers and all that, right? Those are all advanced applications of 3D printing and more advanced versions of it are going to come, right? And similar case to how um, construction printing is going to go, um, evolve, right? We are talking today about um, concrete printing, right? Uh, you know, even in cobalt itself, um, they are actually developing another application to be applied to the existing printer, whereby it can help to do skin coating, plastering, as well as painting and putting in reinforcement, everything done by the robot itself. That means you are minimizing human touch or human intervention at every level of development in construction, right? And that's only talking about cobots, um, future projections, right? So imagine, not only you are doing the walls, but also people who are going to do, uh, the robot itself is going to do the painting of it, right? It can scan the smoothness of the wall. If there's any rough edges to it, the printer can spray um, you know, um, further concrete and one, uh, cement to smoothen the walls. So you see, the application for all this 3D printer is evolving, right? But if you are to wait for such an application to mature, then only you want to, you know, have the students to be trained and all that, then we are left behind. So that is why I strongly support universities such as Massa, Taylor's. You know, you guys have already been at the forefront in trying to educate the next layers or the next generation of students to adopt these kinds of technology so that when more advances come in, the fundamental is already been laid out. So that it, it's no longer something that's foreign to them to operate, right? And I purely believe that 3D printing is the future, whether it be for steel, um, plastic, titanium, whatever it is, lah, and inclusive of concrete. 3D printing is the way to go, right? You, we look now, you know, we talk about moldings, you know, you have the mass and all that. 3D printer will be the next mass thing. It will be the next mass technology. But how we want to do it is something that will be um, refined as time goes by, but that will be the future. And I think you are at the right step, um, the first step to do it. So I hope whenever you sleep at night, there's no more hesitations. You know, you are doing the right thing, setting up the future generations for you know what is to come. And I think you are laying out the foundation for all of us. So we thank you for your services. <laughs> More than that, I think yeah, application CV <laughs> uh, I think Bruce, your views, I think we've heard from right. you guys talking very well. So I'm going to bring another point then. So you're talking about future, tech, actually don't need the future. Now it's doing something. We're, last week I do one thing is I convert an image to 3D. Then I look at it, it can ready to 3D print. AI involved is a huge change to 3D printing industry very soon. And I don't know how soon, but you can see the thing is like crazy fast. 
And we prepare for students to understand all these works so when they think calm, they can understand how it exactly works, right? Not just waiting the machine to do stuff, we have to understand the basic first. So to me, the machine is just a tool. You don't, you don't care how the, the thing is designed, how the thing evolves. Because some design, like organic design, it, it, it cannot be done by human. It's so complicated. So people who use it understand using, let's say, generative design, the automatic AI design, come out the structure, then 3D printing can do it. No other manufacturing way. So this is the only way. I can say this is the only way you can build the world. Maybe 10, 20, 30 years later, you see all the, all the house look like trees. Because organic is nature. It's also, also good for nature. It's also, this is what 3D printing best to do. And traditional, we only can do rock, flat, e because it's easy. Big human cannot do something internal structure, right? So this is where the thing. La. So the bright future is crazy. Just look more news. Uh, don't stop any single day. It will die. Three days not watching news like oh, uh, like ancient before like not too too many years not not there anymore. So try to see more stuff in technology way. Then you realize that so many use case that you can tell your student and they will away on that. And also thank you for that. I think if you watch Mission Impossible, uh, Tom Cruise he prints the face uh, like this. You say within how many seconds? Uh, you can come out and. Right. Uh, I understand, sorry, there's a question uh, on the floor. Please. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Rossi Han from Futurize. Uh, it's just I'm trying to make sense of things here. I mean, we've been out of the regulatory side, but more on the public policy side. Anything manufacturing, um, 3D printing, I think it's featured in at least three main government policy for development. Right, uh, industry for for mm -hmm. is mentioned in uh, my ST and OST, and even under uh, MITI's uh, new investment aspiration, it specifically mentions additive <coughs> manufacturing as one of the pillars and, and core focus areas. Um, just like to know from the panelists, uh, you know, why why is it such a struggle listening to 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 the, to the forum so far? It, it seems like. You're not getting support and uh, from from the government is actually listed in several major government policies. So could the panelists uh, comment on that? Tapa fisheries is under. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Real realistic thing. Uh, this is. Uh, stuff to because we try a lot and it is a struggle this is a real struggle and uh, as I mentioned technology acceptance and the um, the policy that we have probably suit other industry or existing industry but when it comes to innovation you have to be flexible you know and uh, the way that how you evaluate the way how you process you know validation and all but we are still using the same, um, you know, same procedure, same policy, to try to uh, develop something new. It's very new, you know. Like you mentioned, you know, we don't have the case study yet. You know, things like that. You know, I went to a pitching session. The first, uh, even one of the uh, panel, just go out right away. You know, you know. They don't even understand the technology yet. You know, they want to see uh, anywhere that you guys can work, good, don't they? Things like that. So it is hard to use the same uh, um, process of evaluation. To me. And when we go for mosty and asking this, a lot of paperwork eh, about the projection sales. You know, this is something new, which is even the market is not even used 3D printed part yet. You know, they say even for medical device. Now we are producing, you know, like my case. How can I get the uh, 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 some samples or projection of how many people want to use this? You know, and uh, they are asking about, well, okay, how you, you betul, boleh buat ke, tak boleh buat ke, things like that. There are certain things, you know, when it comes to innovation, you have to be flexible and you have to open up this thing, you know. 
you know, probably you have expertise in the different, and the committees is a lot, you know, 13 people are asking you about the question, and you have to go through a lot of things. And after two years, you know, this is the real case, after two years, we get the feedback <coughs> that our funding is not, uh, is rejected. After two years, you, know, you can't move by waiting. You know, I went to an agency Innovation Malaysia, a lot of agency, all these, mostly, you know, mostly Idana. And the person, uh, recently, the, the person for in the mostly Idana came to visit the press recently. Oh, you know, oh, you banyak minta ni, eh? You know, memang banyak minta satu pun dapat. <laughs> <laughs> and the bad thing is that when we are featured, now one of the mostly um, uh, policies that you need to have industry to be in the research. So university need to tear up in the industry and they go for for any grants. And the committee when look at uh, 3D chess, so 3D chess is a, a big company already. No lah, you have to evaluate based on the uh, capabilities and things like that. You know. So this is the thing, you know. The, 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 I believe that you know, we have to change a bit. Or we have to be flexible a bit in terms of innovation. You want to spearhead innovation, you have to be flexible. You want to give it? Okay, give it. Let them try. You know, if you ask a lot of things, this kind of uh, certification, you guys start the CE lagi, you guys start the FDA. Oi. How are you going to do that? Man? But slowly we have to. So I think the way that how the mechanism works, you know, if you look at the METI, METI punya roadmap for even 3D printing, I've seen it. Everything, but realistically, the industry is not there yet. We are not there yet. We are far away, man. If you look at metal printer, how many people with the metal printer? How the industry will get the services? You know, if that will justify the funds to come in, we don't have metal printer services here, hey, give funding. That is that's good enough, that would be really nice. You can see a lot of people who have own at least. But um, same goes lah. I think the case study that they asked, I believe that there's a lot. I remember, I think oh, even uh, yesterday, Sirim did a dialogue asking about the industry and uh, they call all the association, everything. But people are saying, oh, no, we don't have, we cannot do it because we don't have funding. You know, even university, if you ask, they also don't have funding. They are struggling also. And now even university being asked to do a spin-off company. Now the money from research goes down on university. Yeah. <laughs> so we become, that's the thing, I think uh, things need to change. We need to find uh, some leadership in terms of need to, to really um, uh, change the way how we do things. Because innovation is very fast, technology is very fast. By the time two years, I'm asking for this kind of technology, another two years, this technology is no longer relevant to the industry. So if it takes too much time just to give funding, then kalau I dua tahun tu I dah bankrupt, then I tak tahu berapa. It is another grant that we recently get. I pun terkejut. I dah lupa dah I apply for that. Ni Dr. Teza, you ada ni lah, dah approve lah you punya. After three, four years man. But still lah, tapi government still do the initiative. Uh, don't think that the process, I believe. That's why we make us struggling. Like, if within that three years, kita tak boleh nak maintain, definitely. I don't know lah who's the funding. Duit tu pergi mana, aku tak tahu lah. Uh, but that's the case lah. Make us very struggling to, particularly for product like this, that nobody's doing. And uh, we need um, uh, the government agency to really understand it and help us lah, in a way, to make it faster. So, okay, just to add on to that, I think um, rightfully so, um, the process takes a bit too long. Lah. Um, like I said, even us trying to apply for MOSTI, MOSTI dah berapa keran lah, we were applied. Kan, rejected, rejected. Ada yang sampai sekarang, tiba salahkan TDC pula, kata tak bagi duit. So, you know, even amongst agencies, they are blaming one another, saying, you know, ni tak lepas, ini tak lepas, and all of that, right? And I believe um, these are the kinds of issues that we see, memang, you know, to put it simply, cakap senang lah. <laughs> you know, in a very frustrated sound, right? Cakap, you know, 3D printing is there. But there's no actual commitment being put in. Let's look at Singapore. 
Singapore has dedicated more than 100 million sing specifically on additive manufacturing now. That's why their HDB unit came up with a company to develop their own 3D printer now. They are doing yourself. Uh, Singapore, supported by government. Government of Singapore is supporting themselves. They are moving it themselves. So, you know, we don't have to go far. Right? Let's look at our part. Of course, people say, you know, Singapore to that advance. Yes. But then there needs to be some sort of accountability to say, look, if they can do it, why not have a little bit? Like, it doesn't have to be, you know, put 100 million inside. But have a certain fraction of it to show some form of commitment to it. Lah. Right? You say you really want to do it. You know, adalah that some that of some of that commitment and betul doktor kata especially in concrete in construction kan why we why do i say it's difficult for us to do a sample kan kalau you nak buat satu benda kecil mungkin will cost about 100 or 1000 lah you nak buat satu rumah berapa lah saya kan people are asking for sample rumah okay lah satu rumah berapa nak buat kan how you know it it multiplies right especially with construction industry And I'll give you a very small, uh, a short anecdote lah. Macam mana Cobot ni boleh start? Cobot is our manufacturer. is the manufacturer of the technology that we bring in lah. It's from Denmark. The company was started because the government of Denmark supported the university that supported the initiative to develop the 3D printer. That's how Cobot became the number one 3D printer provider in the world. The number of sales of printer that they have is more than the combined number two all the way up to number five. They are currently present in over over um, in six continents, and they have more than 70 printers sold. We are talking about concrete, large-scale printers, and the whole company was started because the government of Denmark put in the money to invest and look into 3D printing. Of course, supported by industry, right? But it was initially because of the government support on this. But when it comes to Malaysia, we try to say we we look. I mean, I'm not sure how the policy is being done. But they look at how the others are doing. They say that they want to do it. But when it comes to real commitment, it doesn't reflect what the other countries are actually doing. So how are you going to replicate the same result? And at the end, at the end of the day, it's the industry like us. You know, we try to change, right? Like I said, the co-founders, we started the company with the intention of wanting to build affordable housing. It's not so much we want to make money. Of course, we want to make money. Lah. Who starts a business you know, not wanting to make money, right? But we want to make money, but at the same time, we want to tackle the issue of affordable housing. Now, we are not saying that, you know, we are going to solve the whole affordable housing. I, I know there are certain caveats to it. There are certain complexities to the issue. We understand that, right? But the initiative that we have brought upon by our own investment is lacking the support of a government to actually help with the initiative. So at the end of the day, we are suffering. Right, and I'll be very transparent. KBN has lasted for two, three years with our own pocket money. I don't know how long we're going to last, right? And, and that's a scary fact, right? For us, uh, at, at least you know, um, Asla as a company, right? Um, I'm not sure how the other companies are doing, but I believe that with construction, it's even more intense, right? And again, so this, you know, just to answer your question, it's not just the policy. The policy is there but there's no commitment to actualize it, right? So that's the issue that we face lah, fundamentally. Thank you. Implementation, exactly. Yeah, and, and so maybe, maybe, sorry, I want to say a few other things, otherwise I want to oh, okay, okay. No, 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 go ahead. Hop, you want to say something? Uh, sure. I, I look at this. I use an analogy. For school, we educate students, and then students graduate and then go into the industry. And then industry come back and complain, all these students doesn't meet our requirements. <laughs> so, I guess this is the dilemma. I mean, in terms of government, we have funding, we have policy, we want to help you. But the industry sometimes also say that we need help on this, but we don't get anything. So maybe, on one side, government want to provide help. On one side, industry need help. But what is provided and what is needed is disconnect. So I guess this this will come to this kind of situations that we are facing right now. So maybe we need more communication between government and industry to really look into what industry requires, requests and then what government can provide. So I think this will uh, eventually, uh, gradually close it. Yeah.
Yeah, exactly. Actually, that was also uh, what I wanted to say is that you know there is that that there, there must be a meeting of minds. Um, I mean, to say that the government doesn't come up with these policies is actually not correct. I actually think that you know you don't have to look very far. If you look at the government's budget every year, there are a lot of innovative policies throughout. Three D printing is one of those examples. But it's always, and I wear my head not so much as a moderator, but now as a practitioner. Uh, every year, I have so many questions from clients, not just in Malaysia but globally, because we do a lot of cross-border work. Hey, your government introduced this in the budget. How do we apply for either an exemption or you know to, to, to qualify? You can never get a straight answer. IRB, you say talk to MOF, and MOF will say talk to so and so. You go one big merry-go-round, okay? And it's not too dissimilar, I think, from what. These gentlemen are saying. Can, can, can I add something? Oh. Another thing I I I realize the agency in Malaysia is sometimes much redundant. I don't know. Much we don't have champions in Malaysia. That um, same agency do the same thing sometimes. But kadang-kadang when we approach them, we say, um, you know, we can do it, but we cannot get it because this is not our territory. You have to go another agency. And we go to another agency, and they say, mm, "We also not." Eh? So sometimes they are promoting the same thing, but there is no champion at all. Mm. So probably the allocation is there, but whoever have a good influence to the committee, then you can get that. Mm. You know? Yeah. So, okay. Which was what uh, I wanted to say actually. So in my experience, I mean, and one of them which came on the newspapers very recently, uh, Elon Musk after he spoke to YAB Prime Minister. Got license. Um, I'm happy to say we advised on that, but in my entire practice doing telco for nearly twenty years, it's only the second time I've seen it. Yeah, but the fact is that boleh jalan, right? You need to speak to the right people. Airbnb when they came in, we advised them. Netflix when they came in, we advised them, right? Um, Grab, we advised. So all of these were groundbreaking, right? I remember at the time Anthony Lok. Also, grab. You wanted to license uh, all of these things. Uber exited. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that in Malaysia, to be fair, it, it, it does. Some things move. Some things move. But the right people have to hear it. It has to be of a certain critical mass. 3D printing. I'm sorry to hear or say until I was asked to sit on this panel. I have not heard of this initiative, but clearly a lot of groundwork has been done. And and so and maybe it is. A nice conclusion to today's uh, discussion, which is to say that uh, number one, industry must come together. You must stand united. You must bring in academia. Academia must interact with industry. The sandbox that Futurize is proposing is fantastic. You need to bring in the correct uh, people. Don't just bring in the regulators, because the regulators will be driven by policymakers. Which is the right ministries. So I mean, I'm just I wanted to make a list for the medical industry. You must have MOH, MDA, NPRA, and it cannot just be one sandbox applies across industry. Because clearly, to someone like Bruce, there is no regulation. You want to print flowers, go and print flowers. Nobody's going to stop you from doing that. But the moment you want to print a skull, as you say, or something, there's certain qualities must come in. You want to print a drug, yeah, uh, that must be regulated. Okay, but you cannot pass one law that applies to all of them, because you will not need to regulate the drug like how you regulate the building of a house. Bomba would not be interested in how you produce uh, a pill. And so, if you are to create that regulatory sandbox, it must be quite uh, a, a determined or considered sandbox that is industry specific. Yeah. The final thing is that this sounds like it will be quite painful because it would require some political will. And I think the other difficulty, also just listening to the panelists, is that they may not be able to show a very uh, financially viable model, right? Because of the high startup costs, because of certain uh, considerations, um, and and therefore, if this sandbox is set up, it must be, I think, first with a discussion amongst industry and academia, so that they understand the lay of the land. And then with very pragmatic steps to move things forward. Sorry, Ali, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um. Um. Truly, truly, with uh, 
with you with regards to the regulatory sandbox. Uh, the uh, what we've been doing at Futurize when we develop any regulatory framework or guideline, when we develop when we develop a certain guidelines, it is industry specific. There is no regulatory sandbox that fits everything. Therefore, when we develop all these uh, guidelines or soft law. The, the regulators are very specific to that specific industry. So maybe from this conversation, we what we can uh, identify which industry in 3D printing that we would like to focus first. Maybe, I, I don't know, it depends on the needs. Maybe it depends on the champion coming from from the regulators, whether okay, we are seeing, we have already seen the construction. I'm just giving an example. There is a need to regulate, but when it comes to other areas or industry, for example, healthcare, we are already aware that uh, when it comes to medical devices, we need to go back to MDA. But again, it's a bit tricky. We already know that. When it comes to MDA, they have processes that need to be followed. Maybe there are some leeway that we can connect the dots from the regulators directly to the healthcare and your industry. <coughs> so all the soft law that we develop is very specific to the specific industry. Although 3D printing, it can uh, cut across different industries per se, but we can start small first. I mean, that's my take on that. Thank you, and, and I think really, um, just listening, you know, Futurize plays such a critical role. So, so I hope you don't take it as this is Futurize bashing. It's not. In fact, I think I find it very constructive feedback to Futurize, and and maybe it's something to help. Uh, if you look at uh, the JPDP, the Jabatan, um, the, the Perlindungan Data Pribadi of all uh, departments, I'm pointing out the Privacy Department because uh, when the PDP law was passed in 2010, um, I was there to help the Commission set up. Do you know how they implement data privacy laws in Malaysia? In Malaysia, data privacy laws, there are 11 codes of practice. So data privacy, yes, we have a general federal law, but we now have 11 industry codes of practice. Telecommunications is one, banking is one, right? Law is one. So you have, I guess, a template to work within the regulator where it's very specific industry codes of practices which apply to you. So you have a federal law that says this, the code of practice may say extra or less because your industry cannot implement certain things. right? So again, this should be, I think, a policy that you also could, uh, when, you, when you reach out to the regulators or, 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 or the ministries to say, hey, follow this, your, your regulators already done something like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I just want to quote back what Dr. Andy said just now that we we start small, we start, you know, we take a baby start um, to come up with um, a soft law and how can we regulate credit for Okay. Um, so, so, because I'm the, the, the group team for future eyes, one, we have, you know, uh, we did our research on what are the similarities of all the industry career that we can touch and, okay, let's start with this. One of it is on CD. That's not when we still do something about, you know, the printing is a tool. Yeah, the printer is a tool. Yes, I have to agree, but we order for... Uh, So we look into safety as one of the 
Before we can regulate, we need to know the standard. The case study dah been done, then you can regulate this thing with the safety, what's the limitation, thing that. but we don't have that. You know, all this industry come to us, whether, can we do this, can we do this? But we don't have any, kalau in Europe, they have national center for additive manufacturing. We should look at on the regulation, we should look at on the policy, we should look at on the certification, all of this. It's like a there, there are repository place, so they can use all these things to answer the question whether how we're we going to regulate this thing, but we don't even have that. How are we going to have that if somebody don't even use it, if the industry is not there yet? So it's, it's <laughs> that's why we say, much like Singapore, again, we, they just put under them, we say, don't care. This, let's let's create this industry first. Let's create the uh, technology first. Let's understand the technology first. Either you want to put this to private, or the government want to do it. This depends. If you deem 3D printing will be the future manufacturing technology, if you deem 3D printing will lead or will become the technology that is so important, then we need to have this. We need to create this. We need to spend. We need to fund. You know, got it that nobody's near. We gonna add up. You want to regulate definitely. You know, you know. You want to use existing pun. It's okay. Macam now sekarang, printed product tak ada regul tak ada standards. You don't have three D printed metals punya standard to look into. How are we going to validate our printed part? You know, put into skulls. So what we do is that we look into standards that are being accepted by MDA now using the uh, casting dengan ni. That's the standards that we have to meet at least before we can put the implants into the knee. So you can use certain existing uh, uh, regulation in order to make sure that in Kalau, that one is not being accepted. I don't think so I can do business with that. This again, the industry. But then we don't have that thing. So sekarang ni actually the most important part. Then recently dengar ada Meranti pun nak came out with this ni. The only thing is that I I don't believe that uh, you know, the government agency if kalau nak buat satu centre untuk ni, you need to have the expertise to ni. No. What is your core expertise? If your core expertise in regulate to this thing or data repository ke apa, it's okay. Policy making. Uh, policy maker does not need to have 3D printers to have own 3D printers you know, to create a lab for them. So I believe strategy partnership lah. Ini macam sekarang because 3D printing is so much hype sangat. Everybody put proposal 3D printing. Now, it's not about private or the university. Kalau university you nak dapat grant put 3D printing, insyaAllah you will dapat grant because of that education. Uh, education, you can but. So that's why we need to have champion actually to drive this thing. 
agency yang can hold this thing can be referred kita boleh refer kan if let's say futurize will able to be a champion industry definitely akan support this thing so kalau government tak percaya kepada private industry private companies to, to lead this thing use agency but at least somebody can start ni lah we don't have champion macam mana <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah i think if you don't mind i think you know she's saying something else but i i think both very practical considerations um i think you know what you're saying is that if you don't have a driver nothing gets done but what she is also trying to say is that just to get it off the ground to find a driver you need to provide some practical solutions to some obvious questions that the guys who are making the decisions will ask so this is the thing so, but i i mentioned okay we come back to the, this this thing because uh, at the end yang macam i mentioned tadi bukan kita tak boleh guna certain evaluation process because the technology is now is very fast macam sekarang ni dah tak relevan the whole process now to evaluate the new technology ataupun the new yang kita dah ni is is no longer ni that's why bukan yang kata flexible to to towards yang you tak kira company apa yang bagi no yeah, but I, I believe that this now you have to change you know rigid kalau you too rigid ataupun you use the same ni memang tak 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 boleh it's yeah. not longer Yeah, I actually understand what you're saying. So the flexibility that you are asking for is not the flexibility that you are thinking of, right? There is a law that applies, but what he's saying is that, for example, if you have a regulatory sandbox like what Bank Gara did, you need a certain license before you can transfer money or remit. But within the sandbox, you don't need a license. You're given one year to go and uh, so, so, so yeah, this is called passion, and this is what we need. This is what we need in industry. Um, but no, I, I think you are itching for a question. Yes. To, to uh, reaction to something Mr. Moret really said about uh, the, the work experience doing the PDTA and and where where later on you merge and you have different practice groups codes of practice. I, I think at this point in time it looks like it is something that this initiative can adopt because there are many problems. Or rather, not very complicated problems, but spread across two main sectors, and uh, I think that that model is something maybe we could consider moving forward to have in different sectors, construction, medical device, and so on and so forth. But um, just also to reflect what Doctor and Jiang uh, Wan and Bruce and uh, said just now about the industry, I- I'm curious because um, it's true you don't hear a lot of talk in the public space about mm. 3D and manufacturing. But we know it's important. The government knows it's important. Although it would not be in at least three <laughs> public policy <laughs> papers, you know, published. Uh, but this is an observation. We were visiting, uh, had a study visit to, to Paris, Asho, Le Bourget, and And we noticed that there was a strong voice of uh, Additive manufacturers there in what is the world's biggest um, air show, and they were speaking to the industry, aerospace industry. Advertorials were taken up in the official newsletters, booths were there, you know. Um, and, and I think even in Europe, and we're talking also addressing the American market here, you know, there was also a need for the industry people, the additive manufacturing industry world. To engage and make themselves visible to their potential market. Vice versa, um, a week before that, we were in Dubai, and uh, and the champion for UAE innovation right now is one of them is the Dubai Future Foundation, directly under the Emir himself, and they had in front of the building. A completely built structure, three D, which is actually used as a co-working space, and that was one of the things that they highlighted. You see, it's very simple. They don't have thirty, forty policies. This was this was only five topics: aerospace, wellness, environment, uh, mobility, and durability was one of them. So it was very clear cut where UAE is going where they're spending their money, 
and that was an example to me of a state push championing this technology. So, so just to share some experiences, I think both have to meet somewhere between the industry too needs to get itself organized, coordinated, put a very strong voice out there to the public and the government, and vice versa, government too needs to have the right way to champion this particular sector. So, yeah, just my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've just been flashed to say this is the last question. Any last questions? Uh, two questions. Okay, maybe if I could trouble you for both questions and then we will pick one or answer both if we can, if time permits. But please, go ahead. Well, I'm, uh, I just studied industrial design. So I kind of heard about the but I never really got into it. So I wonder how do lecturers actually prepare the students to you know like be good at this tool because I'm currently worked in a bad company so sewing machine that's my tool but I'm really interested like how do you prepare students to really power this tool or how do industry find their operators to use your machines thank you for the question and the second question uh, might be more broad in terms of how this can fit into the paradigm and factory overall because I heard a lot about how deep breaking can be used for manufacturing in general. But as much as manufacturing is a tool, I don't know how it fits in the paradigm for some ref like run away actually, yeah. But I think in manufacturing I think the lithography chips. We don't use seven nanometer for everything, as much as it make everything kind of promise, because it's just not profitable. The most profitable looks on the ninety nanometers, sixty five. <coughs> so as much as IT manufacturing can be useful, I want to. I'm not exactly clear how the fit in a niche would be absolutely more advantageous compared to subtracting manufacturing or traditional CNC machining. <coughs> Firstly, second of all, uh, about what she was asking just now about the industry that the UAE is talking about. Oh. Is there any, maybe not is there, but from Malaysia's perspective, would there be any industry should we be targeting, like what UAE is doing in terms of uh, aerospace, whatever they can or not? Because if you have pilot gloves, for example, it's only $6 billion in market cap in the whole world. So there would be certain industries that would be better off marketed compared to others. Like yeah. Okay. Thank you for your and question. Yes. Also, the lead. <laughs> Please carry on. <laughs> See, I keep late, or the last little bit more at that time, but you know, we had a time limit. Bottlenecks, Dr. Ija just now. You mentioned uh, how laser machining, right? Improve over time, we had high lasers and quad lasers and whatnot. You can just add more lasers and improve the quality of your manufacture in for that kind of manufacturing. I don't know what are the bottlenecks in this industry that prevent us from making this cost effective and also manufacturing at a higher speed. More units per hour. Like, uh, is it in terms of speed? Perhaps gantry technology to move your your printer back and forth, and that'll be a better industry to solve. Or maybe other things related to three printing or resin technology or a chemical solution that will make this possible. That's a little. No more. Thank you for all your questions. I'm going to say this for the gentleman over there. I suggest we've got two uh, academicians here. Please uh, see them after this. Uh, your first question, I think, was already answered earlier on. Uh, that is going to be industry specific for the use itself, right? And quite niche as opposed to mass produce. So whether or not it's larger or smaller will depend. Uh, the second question I will allow, which is, you know, where do you think Malaysia should go or aim for a particular industry? We five, we've heard five. The third question again, I think maybe take it offline. And the fourth uh, didn't hear it. I apologize, but I am conscious of time. So maybe on that note, your second question, just to repeat. Uh, if Malaysia had to identify a particular area or industry that we should aim for for 3D printing, uh, what would that be? Correct question? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, over to the, the four of you. I think I will face it equal So, you got construction, you got medical, <laughs> I got third or hyper consumer. So, basically, to me, it's like whatever you have the use case, this, this is my customer. So, for them, uh, yeah. Right, this is a simple answer. 
for industry very simple. Wherever there's money, they will do it. <laughs> so if you can find something, you cannot really go and create a market and then go in. I think a lot of time Malaysia is doing it. We want to focus on this, so let's create something around it. Whether there is a market or not, we don't care. So at the end, it ends up not so successful. Anyway, uh, I'm not really asking about what kind of industries can use it, but rather what particular use is applied. For example, I know a lot of people everything uh, in terms of what they like, in just certain parts, uh, especially actual manufacture, traditionally. You first come out your use case, then ask me your priority. Yeah, well, I, can, I can guide you through because you are you are you have to question that no answer now because even the answer the question itself is not clear. I face this kind of a uh, question a lot. Questioning as much as I'm asking you for your yeah because yeah. every single project they have their use case either from specific side or not from specific side. If necessary or not, it depends on the project itself. Let's say I do glasses, casing, it can be 3D printing, also can be traditional way. But how customized you want, is that cost effective? That also affects the cancer. Do you understand? Yo, this is the question of how. And when you have no specific requirement, it's very hard to answer this question because there is no fixed answer. That is, there's this world is not one to ten definitely fix one plus one equal to two. It's not that simple. You have to see many variables to get the exact answer you want. Well, you, you cannot, you really need to know what you want to do. For example, the glasses box. Okay, if you just want a box, go for traditional one. If you want a box with all your customer name print on it, 3D print. So you, you have to have some idea of what you're going to do. You cannot say that for certain things, which way should I go? So I need to know what certain things need for, for this. Yeah. If I may say, uh, this is not my industry, I'm asking you for... Because, like this, uh, we ask a lot of general questions, but I think a lot of these are answered before on the technical side of things. We talk about this custom name, if you want not. We come to the <coughs> to a certain extent, this is qualified. They will know, okay, this use case would benefit from you. Yeah, th thank you very much. I appreciate the question, but I've already seen some people headed to the door. So maybe if you're interested, I will uh, let you carry on uh, once we've adjourned uh, the session. So thank you, everyone, uh, for listening. Panelists, thank you very much. It was very engaging. Thank you.